I'm very happy to be here at this virtual world conference to talk about something really important, community building in a changed world. And community is, as you say, everything. It's the people to rely on, to serve uh, and to cooperate with. And uh, I have a great panel here today with me to discuss these questions. And we will talk a little bit about uh, what a community is, why it's important, and how you can work to support your community in different ways. Tools and techniques that you can deploy in your environments. Uh, so let me introduce once again, we have Jernay Pintar from Ljubljana Science Park in Slovenia. Uh, we have Vaidu Mikain from Tartu Science Park in Estonia and Mikke de Bruyne from uh, Utrecht Science Park in the Netherlands. Wonderful to see you. And uh, we will have questions uh, <laughs> here. And uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, please use the chat room and ask the questions so that we can uh, answer them uh, during the session. So let me start with you, uh, uh, Janay. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your community? What's it like? So um, we have a community that spans not only from startups, but also into scale ups. So growing into large companies that are present all over the world. And then we also segment it into more specific verticals. So for example, one of our very strong verticals is health, um, where we combine all companies that deal with, for example, contemporary e-health um, and it was also this scale up community, the one that in the pandemics was responsible of developing a fast prototype of respirators when it was an emergency in Slovenia and we didn't have our own uh, respirators, right? So our engineers quickly developed uh, our own units, uh, medical masks, even one cure uh, and stuff like that. So having a community is uh, always a brilliant, a brilliant thing. It sounds like a very tech-oriented and creative community. And what do they mean to you? What do they mean to, to, to us, the companies? I mean, they're the essence why we're here. I mean, when you have the companies, you not only have their loyalty, you have their brain, you have their brands, you have their know-how, you have their power of persuasion. Uh, and uh, at least but not all, you also have their purchasing power. You know, when they're startups, the purchasing power is small, but as they grow, the purchasing power increases. And that's a great benefit also when you try to allocate more resources into developing your park. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, let's move over to Tartu Science Park in Estonia. Uh, and I remember that you were saying that these are the guys who watch your back uh, when we spoke earlier this week. Can you tell me a little bit more about your community and what they mean to you? Thank you, Lena. Uh, it's a really ungrateful uh, panel that we are given and, and the question because we are living in a multiverse of communities. We have our science park and innovation areas community, which is like one team. And then we have our startups. And, uh, and so uh, it's a really difficult question. Uh, what do they mean to me? And as, as we were talking that, you know, for me, the community, in essence, it means that we are doing stuff together with those guys and, and they are having my back and uh, I'm having their back. So um, I cannot like put it any more simple as that. Could you, how, how big is the size of your community? Is it, is it big? Is it uh, specialized? Oh, or Estonia is tiny. So uh, even if you are looking at on a countrywide, we are a relatively small community. We were just having fun in uh, talking with Mika and and their community is about as big as our city is. So uh, if you're talking about Tartu, which is 100,000 inhabitants, and uh, not all of them are startuppers, even though the name itself, uh, the city name is in a word of startup. So uh, we are, uh, in a very narrow sense, I would say we are a couple of hundred, uh, but in a broader sense, a couple of thousand in, uh, in the area. But, it's a really, really difficult thing to put my finger on and say that, that that's the number. Okay. So moving over to uh, Utrecht and Mieke, you are in a campus-based uh, science park where you have a lot of students as well. Can you tell us a little bit about yes. 
Well, our community is, uh, as Vital said, quite big. We have 70,000 people here at the Science Park. So we have 50,000 students coming here every day for the university, University of Applied Sciences, but also for the University Medical Center. And um, um, uh, we have, of course, uh, a lot of employees, which are about 20,000 here. And I think what we do as a foundation, because we are a foundation, you can see us as the umbrella over, all, over the science park, so over all companies, institutions, and uh, universities, is to glue all these people together and to make to give them a kind of sense of belonging that is said earlier you know that belonging is an important word for communities but uh, we actually use three words uh, we say belong believe and behave and that means that we want to belong together but that is more an internal focus so we we identify ourselves with the science park and we feel part of it but we also have a mutual goal we believe in something and we want to put that forward. And in our science park, it is a lot about um, impact we want to make. So a societal, but also an economic impact, mainly uh, with focus on life sciences or sustainability that we want to uh, put forward and make the world a better place to say it uh, quite dramatically. And behave, what do you mean by behaving? So that you act in the way to accomplish the goal. So you th you, uh, you know, you so the things you do uh, contribute to the mutual goal that you have. And you see now that we will come to this topic later. I know, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit, sorry, Lena, but um, you know, that COVID is really kind of setback, of course, for communities, you know, because I strongly believe that a community is built, needs physical presence, need physical proximity. So with an impossible thing to do that now, that is, it's hard to build a community. At least that's my opinion. Mm. Mm. Belong, believe and behave. <laughs> so uh, we need the sense of belonging. You mentioned a strong vision and also some values to guide us along the way. Um, is that what it's like in, in Ljubljana Science Park? Are those the kind of values that you put into community? If we're talking about what, what constitutes a community, very often when yeah. people around the world talk about community, they, they misconcept and they think that when you get people together, that that's a community. That is by no means so. I mean, every cinema performance yeah. should be a community by that definition, right? A community works completely different. Community means that you have people oriented <laughs> into <laughs> each other, having a sense of belonging having a kind of uh, dedication to each other, being loyal to some brand, having a peer-to-peer -peer understanding of pains and needs. And when there's a need, they're, they're capable of dedicating their own resources to someone else. In most cases around the world, you will see it vice versa, that people always think, what's in it for me? Now, Per se, the definition of a community is that, yeah, you gain from it, but you also put in it, right? So it's very different. And through time, when this cycle repeats, you get uh, values. And these values are not just written down on a piece of paper. People really live them. You as a team, you are a live example of these values. Or in the long term, it becomes a culture. Mm -hmm. Are you very much like the pay it forward culture that we have in Silicon Valley? Is that something that you apply? Uh, we have a little bit different. Uh, no, no, no. We have we have four four uh, uh, um, core values that we that we follow as the whole team. The first one is of course technology. This is something that all of our companies share, and if we do not share it, then there is no resonance, you know, this is a value that you need to have because then the companies resonate to you, right? So technology must be there. Now, the second and the third one uh, are growth and ambition, uh, courage, right? So you have to be brave to take uh, big steps, uh, go into the world. And the last one is cooperation, because very often it happens that companies try to do everything solo. And us as technology parks, it's our jobs to bring them together because when they're combined, their penetration power is much bigger. So community building is a really strong strategic uh, point of a technology park. 
What I find interesting is that there are not so many science parks focusing on uh, community building. Why do you think that is? Oh, I, I think that one is really simple. The thing is that um, science and technology parks and big areas of innovation are largely primarily defined by real estate. And real estate, when you look at into financial numbers, it's big numbers. When you start developing communities, it's tiny numbers. In the beginning, it's really small. It's, it's such small numbers that every director thinks, oh, this is neglect neglectable. Let's not deal with this. But when you develop it and you, uh, in, when you make it into, for example, large events with big sponsorships, when you make it into commercial services with purchasing power coming in from the scale up companies, now the numbers start getting bigger. <laughs> mm, very interesting. Moving over to you, Vaidu, because you were talking when we spoke earlier about the importance also about those events and bringing people together. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you gather your community and what is important in order for it to flourish and, and deploy? Oh. I'll just piggyback on Yerne because uh, what he said that, you know, the community has to resonate with each other. And uh, in ideal world, it also complements or uh, perfects each other. Uh, the kind of, uh, no, on that side, there is a startup day, which uh, is a, the big event that we, we are having in, in Tartu. And uh, before we acted as a community, as we, when we acted as uh, like each, um, separate entity we had like maybe a few hundred participants as a major event we already called it like a landmark event uh, this year in january when the people were still allowed to come together the very same startup they gathered over four and a half thousand participants and speakers and uh, from dozens of countries and that is the difference that is the magnifying effect that yerne actually brought out that you can have as a as a community before that you know you are doing your thing in your own uh, small bubble, but if you put all the bubbles together, they might explode. That also might happen, but you might get out something really beautiful. But one thing that I'm still stuck at, and this is a question to Mika from me, is that how the hell are you going to get your 70,000 people strong community to behave? We are real, we have real difficulties to get like 70 people to behave and, and you get like, uh, so many more to behave so i would i would really like to hear that one we are taking that one in just a moment but i would like to know how did you reach the insight that you have how did you uh, come to terms with the community being really important for tattoo science park well that's a good question um, i have a like a official theory and then i have a personal and not so official theory and of course, I'm going to tell the non-official one. So the non-official one is that since we are not a gravity center, we are not known on the world map, we are even not known in the European map, and uh, maybe not even known in Eastern European map. So there is a need. There is a need to put yourself on the map or on the radar. You have to show out somehow. And if you are a small place, then uh, collaboration or acting together is one of the few means which really is both the like, push and also the pull at the same time. So we had to cooperate. Otherwise, we would be just uh, like a place on the map and maybe some lucky guy who is like circulating the globe touches it and says that I want to go there. Like the holiday game that we had just a few seconds ago on, uh, on the ISP platform that I want to go and have a holiday there. Now people already recognize more that uh, there is something in this part of the world and perhaps it's uh, worth to visit it. Great. So over to Utrecht and the $10 million question. How do you get the 70,000 community uh, to behave? <laughs> well, you know, the Dutch, you know, we're so disciplined, you know that. So it's easy for us. <laughs> No, it is, it, is a it is a question. Actually, I wanted to bounce back a question to Yerne as well, because I agree with Yerne when he said that community building is a two-way street, you know, it's give and take. And I strongly believe it is. But then, Yerne, is it difficult for you to, uh, to develop that, uh, you know, to work on that? Because for us, in a way, it is. You are right, of course, Fido, 50,000 students. It, it, it's a big community here. Um, 
we try to build it because we strongly believe uh, that it has a lot of benefits, but we will come to that later, as I understood. But how do we do it? Maybe not to try to reach them all at one time, because that is impossible. But we have, for example, we call it Utrecht Science Park Cafes. And we do this on a regular basis. And I strongly believe that reputation, you know, in the end, uh, pays off. So we started uh, to organize it and maybe 10, 20 people came. But we just continued and we have a very tight program. So it is, we have a speaker. So it is also something about life sciences or, or um, sustainability, something that's going on here at the park. And it is a possibility for you when you attend to uh, see people from the network and to uh, to connect with others. And then, you know, this thing start rolling because then people say, hey, the, you know, it's always a good speaker. The quality is good. The food is good. You know, it's organized well. And I, I always benefit from it because I see important people, people that I like to have in my network. And I think that is the essence of community building, right? So that you gather with people that are not doing the same that you are doing because, you know, it gets interested when we have a different opinion on things because we have different backgrounds. And that's, that's you know, when when... When it is a little bit difficult, then we have a discussion and then we can innovate probably. Um, so we do a lot of that every six weeks and it is, a, as I said, a regular program and it, it works. We also- Would you say, uh, or, okay, that, yeah? that you are uh, one community, all of the 70,000 people, or would you say there's a lot of communities within the community? Uh, yeah, maybe the latter, because you know, it is not really one because if it, you can all already divide it by uh, sustainability and life sciences. Although, of course, you know, healthy urban living, is it sustainability or is it life sciences? Clean air, you know, is it sustainability or is it life sciences? So also there is a kind of crossover, but um, if it is typically life sciences, other people will attend. If it's typically sustainability, other people will attend. If it's typically student, you know, because students live here and if it's more about the development of the park and the things we want to do here and if we want to have food trucks or another bar or other restaurants, other people will come. So in that case, yes, we have separate bubbles within the one community. Yeah, for sure. Mm. And, and do you operate all these events or is there other events in your community as well? Uh, it is mainly operated from here, but there are others as well. Be but people will always uh, contact us and let us know. So we can, uh, because we have, I think, uh, we have good contact with most of people. So we can always help others if they have an event to invite people because we have all the lists, we have all the email. Uh, we have very easy connections with a lot of companies and institutions here. So we help them uh, on that case. Mm, okay. So you had a question for Jenna, right? No, uh, I agreed with her uh, when she said that um, you start from small communities and, and small, small groups. Um, large communities are only when you bring them all together, but otherwise uh, community building is primarily done in smaller groups. Uh, and there's also one very strong aspect in it. For example, three, here we have three community builders, right? But I'm absolutely sure that we are not the only community builders in our parks. Very simply, because not a whole community can love just one person. You know, there are people who like us and there are people who do not like us, but they like somebody else from our team. So you need to have more people so that various kinds of communities can identify with them, right? So you don't only have uh, more micro communities, but you also have more community builders. Right. Yes. And so I think one of the main things in the past when I've been training community builders uh, was, I think, perhaps the main thing was that you should not have the kind of a community builder that wants to be an all star celebrity, which means not allowing to be other faces that deal with community. And second of all, they draw all attention to them instead of drawing attention to members working with members. This is not a celebrity style of community because if you have a celebrity style community, something happens to the, to the celebrity. For example, that person leaves the technology park and suddenly you don't have a community. That's not a real community, yeah. right? 
So you need to have the kind of community builders that are really focused on the people and directing them not into themselves, but into other people making this. I think you have a really good point there. And I think also that I don't know about the size of your organizations, but you might reach uh, the limit where you can't uh, arrange enough events for the community to be satisfied. And uh, we actually started uh, applying something we call community building as a service in Linköping uh, to offer the training to new community managers and to support them with different things like facilities, marketing and uh, events and so on. Uh, would that be something you would deploy in your different communities? Uh, wait just a bit. I think Vido, Vido has uh, his hand up. Yes, yes, I, I can see that. Yeah, would you like um, I like uh, Yerne's philosophy of uh, bringing out the good and bad side and different aspects of community building. And, uh, and since the topic of this panel is about community building, uh, I would like to bring one which is, uh, which I believe is important uh, in my opinion, is that the community is not only about events, it's actually only a minor fraction about events. It's much more about those daily interactions. And uh, Jerni was uh, again absolutely right. We have uh, multiple community members, and as sad as it is, uh, really, I, I can't be liked by anyone. Um, and we have our space guys, we have our deep tech guys, we have our like uh, gaming guys, and they need to talk space gaming and deep tech as well a bit. But it might, it's much more in my mind about this daily communication. And even though if you are taking away this physical interaction to an extent as it, as it has happened these days, uh, you know that the community is working when you, you know, this communication is seamless. It, it's fast. It doesn't happen, have to happen immediately or instantly always, but it happens fast enough so you don't get disappointed or this like left out feeling. Wonderful. And, and how would you say that you manage the daily communication? Do you have any tricks or tips for the audience? Oh, it's hard. Of course, uh, and it uh, requires a constant replenishment of uh, coffee, beer, pizza, and wine. Uh, and I was uh, laughing when Mika was talking about cafeterias because it's like one of the classical theories says that innovation was born in Dutch cafeterias, and we are back to the roots, it seems. So um, it's a daily work, and at times uh, it's really tiring, and you go home and you don't want to talk to your family because you have been done so much uh, socializing during the day. So it has its trade-offs, but it has to be done nonetheless. So yeah. we are just uh, doing it, and we are choosing uh, some of the people, uh, like the right people who enjoy it. You can't force somebody to do who doesn't want to do it. No. So daily activities. Mike, do you have any suggestions on Tools yeah, well, I have to, I understand what Vilo is saying. Of course, I agree that it's not about the events. It's, 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 it's you know, more daily life thing. And as said before, you know, the most um, Nobel Prize winners come from the University of Cambridge. And that is because the, this university in England has the Mensa. So that is the, the place where they have lunch, where they eat. And it's all long tables and, you know, chairs. You come in and you just sit next to each other. You sit next to people you never know. And you do biology and somebody else does physics. And you look at a problem from a different angle and you start discuss it. And on this crossover of different opinions, there that's where innovation starts. So I believe, you know, that that helps. And uh, another example here at our own science park, for example, is we have a new institution coming to our science park. And it's a very large building. It is a 17 floor building. And they decided to make the elevator stop every three floors. And it is from a healthiest perspective. So you have to walk up or you have to walk down. It's better for your, for your health. But the other perspective is I go out the elevator, I have to go two floors up. Lena, I just meet you there. There's always, of course, a coffee corner. And we grab a coffee. And as we walk up, I ask you, hey, Lena, how was your weekend? How are you doing? And there it is, you know, the connection. Uh, you tell me something that it's interesting or i can help you out so this this is a daily daily life thing so it's not a, it is more serendipity you know it is not a a consciously uh, prepared event it is really serendipity but um i strongly believe that a lot of things happened in the serendipity probably more than in the uh, conscious uh, organized uh, events 
So to design your environment so that you have these spontaneous meetings is a really important thing. I can. Was it is, yeah. Um, I thought before our session is, is moving uh, to its end, we, we should reach the topic of the pandemic also and how it's changed how we work with community and the importance of it. And you were touching upon that, Mikke, about how you feel that it's become harder to work with your community. Could you? Yeah. Yes, I, I think it's, of course, it's harder because, you know, we lack uh, physical contact and seeing each other. Um, uh, I ask around a little bit in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, for example, you know, everybody tries to, to find their way. Uh, Amsterdam has uh, behind the scenes um, tours, so they do a virtual tour inside the company at their science park and people can, you know, it's streaming so they can see it online and at least you learn something about companies that are based on your or located on your science park. In Twente, they have the peeking at the neighbors. Uh, these are short movies um, and it's actually meant as a kind of distraction from all the Zoom meetings. So the moment you're really sick and tired of all the Zoom meetings, you go to the website of your own science park, the companies are listed there. You can click on a company and you get a two minute movie about the company. So wow. they call it peeking at the neighbor. So at least you know two minutes, yeah, it's kind of distraction and you kind of learn something from it. So you feel at least maybe a little bit closer to that company because you have some more knowledge about it. Here in Utrecht, uh, we as a science park, as said, we are a kind of umbrella. We have an overview over the park and we see that in a way we have to take the lead now with COVID to make sure that people um, use, uh, the, use the social distancing. So the moment that the first time after summer, when we could start up a little bit again, the companies and the institutions were looking inside their building, you know, is the lecture hall, you know, is it, is it, is it big enough? How many students can come in? If, in this company, how many desks? How can we, you know, move the chairs so we have one and a half meter distance? That's all fine and also very important. But we as a, nobody was th thinking about the public space outside. So if it fits inside your building, does it also fit when you come out of the bus or the train? Does it fit when you park your bicycle? Does it fit when you go for lunch? You know, and that is what we strongly uh, advise other companies. Do not think only inside your own company. Think about the science park as a whole. And of course, we monitor it and we decided um, to keep on monitoring it even after Corona to keep the benefits because there are some benefits, you know, working at home, you know, less cars. So we monitor it all the time and we'll evaluate it and um, keep the good, the good things about it. Wonderful. So in uh, Tartu Science Park, do you, do you agree with what Miki is saying or do you have any other thoughts upon the pandemic and uh, the effects of the pandemic on community building? I think uh, it has had a different effect on, on everybody. My personal belief is that you can actually uphold or sustain the existing communities, that uh, this is doable. Uh, it's a little bit different, but it's doable. It's more difficult to bring the new members in or, or to get new people on board in the community. Because with other guys, you have met, you have gone to sauna together, you have done stuff together already. And now you have to trust a digital person or a face in the zoo. Um, and this what is do you do when you can go to the sauna? You said like, what says in the sauna stays in the sauna. How do you manage that when you <laughs> have a pandemic? That's easy, you know. When uh, you open the sauna door, you come out, you close the sauna door. What stays in the sauna stays in the sauna. That's like taking the elephant out of the refrigerator. That's really easy. <laughs> but uh, the point I, what I want to kind of maybe make here is that uh, referrals and introductions, they have come uh, as an important part. They were important before, but they are even more uh, important nowadays. That I know that I can trust somebody. If Yerne recommends me someone, then I trust this person much more than it's a code call or code contact. So uh, this uh, kind of uh, facilitation has become more important and, uh, and the humanly facilitation nonetheless that computers are asking nowadays that humans are not robots uh, with the captchas. So, uh, like, you know, you have to sound human. But right. uh, now the floor to the last thoughts, the Erne as well, and we are running out of time. Yeah. So uh, do you disagree about anything, Janet? 
No, I completely agree that uh, being a community builder in these times, it's much more difficult because uh, online world is uh, faster. It's much more focused on personal gain without giving back. Um, much bigger distance, individualism. So you can bring people together, but creating, creating values and culture and the feeling of belonging is much more difficult. It is do doable. For example, just last week we had one event where completely new people kind of sense these new values. And I mean, they were all enthusiastic. It was working right. But I think my last uh, message would rather be, you really have to take care of your community builders. Because if you compare that in companies, that's customer care in the, in the companies. And the average time in a company is two years. That's the expiry rate of community builders. So you really have to take care that they have uh, a longer, uh, longer existence. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, we have uh, 15 minutes for questions coming up. So I will put on my glasses so that I can read from <laughs> the uh, Q and A uh, board in the chat room. So uh, first question uh, can from Jack Van Dinteren. Can it be helpful to make a distinction in communities, employees, and networks, companies, institutions? Anyone? To distinction. I didn't quite understand. Sorry. I did no, not again. quite understand. No, that that the community was the employees from the companies, whether the networks were the companies and the institutions. Ah, okay. Internal communities. Yes, that works like a charm. I mean, um, for example, uh, I've been, I've been uh, in for 10 years, I've been entrepreneurship and in, in this internal community building also. And funny enough, there were many different theses. How do you make internal culture go up in flares like wonderful uh, and all of that? And there were many different theses, for example, like having a great secretary that is full of energy. Whenever somebody comes in, it just li she, she lights up the, the space or something like that. Yeah. But funny enough, what Mika said earlier, a good cafeteria that people come and eat lunch together, there is nothing better for an internal community building, not only community building, also communication uh, spread so that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And in, in your opinion, would it be possible to build a community before you have a science park? Of course. I mean, community building, you, you don't need a science park to build it. You, you need people. You need people to bring people. <laughs> My people, you know. <laughs> uh, a question from Malcolm Perry. Maybe you could answer it, Mike. Is there an academic community that is willing to link into the community because in many countries the academic community is in discovery of new of new knowledge but the community of entrepreneurs are interested in answering questions that get them to the money not to discovery a very different perspective is there a different perspective be between the academic community and the entrepreneur the entrepreneurial community you think yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, right now, I'd say it may be different, but it may be the different bubble that, that we that we spoke about before. Uh, what I can see, um, which is a um, a benefit from communities, and this is I think for entrepreneurs, but also for academics, is the access to knowledge and the access to talent. You know, we called it before in our discussion better for the brains. Uh, so there, so an, an are you on the, why don't I just finish my sentence? So I, I believe it's for both of them. It's, it's, it's very um, uh, interesting, you know, because they can pick up talent. You know, it, it is your, your potential, uh, your pot potential employees are in the community as well. So if you do it well, you can, you're the first to pick them. Vido. Yeah, uh, this is something that we have struggled for many years. 
how to actually bridge the gap between academic and business world. And, and we are working on this one also currently with, uh, by building deep tech cases out of universities and trying to get the business cases out of them. And I would say that, yes, there are differences between the academic and, uh, and the business communities. Uh, one of the main uh, kind of observations that I have made is that they have different views on how fast and in what manner a project should evolve. It's never a question of access that you can always get an access to people, but it's a question that the business is driven by different principles and uh, they want to get to the profit faster and uh, the academic community has different goals. And those two worldviews don't meet too often. And, and uh, somehow in, in our, at least, uh, we have seen that they have even spread further away from each other that you get those cursing between academics and businessmen to a certain extent. So I believe that uh, the business world needs to step closer to the academic world also occasionally and try to understand them better. Mm. Can, I, can I also build on both, on both cases? Lena, do you let me? Yes, sure. All right. Uh, so there is, if you take a look at gamification in the world, right? Gamification. So uh, now I'm going to take the most basics, right? Um, there is a table, there is a table where you have uh, all the people um, segmented into four basic groups, how they behave when they are in some communities or something like that. And uh, it's about like this. There's one group that's socializers. You recognize them by the way that they, they always want to together with, be together with somebody. The work is not important. Being together is the important. The second, you have the achievers. Achievers are the ones that want to achieve some top score, wealth, or something like that, right? That would be entrepreneurs. So business community would work in the achiever, uh, in the achiever square. There is the third part, that's the explorers. I think many of us here are explorers. That's people who are driven mainly when there is a computer game, we would be searching all the map, every corner, looking at every possible thing. That, that's the explorers, right? But then there's the fourth group. The fourth group is the killers. Now, the passion of the killers is to get in and just beat the next guy they meet, <laughs> right? So the two very similar groups are achievers and killers. And there is an overlap. These two are very often entrepreneurs, whereas academics are mainly explorers. So when you do bring the two groups together, you should kind of, for example, we had that kind of an event last week, right? You should kind of make it that the, finding of something new on the edge of the map is also an achievement, right? So that you bring the two, the two like this together and you take them along. Mm. But it's like uh, many of you have told also about the importance of bringing different groups together and have the different disciplinaries, the different uh, industries coming together to explore new things. And this must be the same when it comes to academia, business, and also maybe society, I think. Uh, so uh, that's a good perspective. Uh, there's a question for you also, Janae, about how you select your tenants, if you do it, or uh, if anyone can move into your science park. And the reason for asking, it's Malcolm Perry who is asking, is if you are a self-selected community or if you are put together. Uh... All right, um, now I'm gonna make a special distinction. For, for about a decade, the community was equal to tenants. Nowadays, it's no longer so. Our community spreads far away out of technology parks. So being a tenant here does not mean either that you're part of community because we don't build, I mean, even among our tenants, we have people who are not really psychopaths, but they do not get well together with other people. And you should not put them in communities. You deal with these guys one-on-one, -on -one, right? You, you really have to take care of what kind of people you bring together, right? And so being a tenant does not mean, but we do have a preference of our, of, on our tenants being uh, technological, right? And uh, well, then the groups either into the startup section or into the SME section. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, do you have something you would like to add? Yeah, because uh, I think that for us in the Netherlands, it is uh, a true thing that we 
uh, do a kind of selection. Not everybody is allowed to to uh, to settle here on the science park, and you know that probably was before when it was more about real estate and it was just you know buildings. But we focus really on the content. So if you want to relocate or if you want to settle here at the science park, what you do has to fit in. And we have only research and development, and we have. Um, uh, we focus on asset sustainability and life sciences, and we need that that connection. And that's probably also why our academia and entrepreneurs they work together. You know, because the researchers do research, but you know the entrepreneurs they they make it or they sell it or they use it. So that we we want to that that bridge all the time. So it is quite a strong uh, selection. But I we we believe our community grows by adding you know, different perspectives, but still are compatible. Interesting. And it seems like both of you are maybe moving from property, uh, handling pro property and moving I mean, into... Uh, for example, perhaps I would also add that um, not only technical companies are welcome. For, I mean, for oh. our companies, it's great that we have a kindergarten here on the premises and then we have a pharmacy and stuff like that. If yeah. you don't have that, it's not really a viable community. You know, you, you need to have support services around, right? But perhaps there is one more part of the answer that I'd, I'd like to add in. Um, when you're building a community, and I, I'm talking not about tenants, but others coming in from outside, hundreds of kilometers away, right? It's really good if you kind of focus, you build your community, you build a core, you build a core, and then you try to lift that core upwards into stronger, better companies, more renowned companies, because once you have really strong companies in your community, everybody else tries to join in. Mm. So, you know, yeah. you have to push that bubble up and then everybody wants to come. Wonderful. And a question for you, Vaido, uh, from Josep Piki. Are the parks the hubs of trust for increasing our international, international community belonging? would you say? Uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, I'm yes. not sure I understood it. That our innovation hubs, our science parks uh, and areas of innovation are uh, keeping our international community together. Uh, yes, yes and no, because uh, every community is what the community made builder or the element who is running it makes it to be. So you can be the type of science park who doesn't like to socialize either, as Yerne said about some of the companies, and you can be a very successful one. But by nature, to me, it also seems that science parks are explorers, and we tend to go abroad and explore, and we tend to take part of international conferences, even if they are virtual. So but maybe it's also being like an innovation hub that welcomes international talent and international startups, and maybe get them into the community easier since we are very dense and very concentrated. Would you agree? I think actually the answer lies what Yerne said, that if you have those uh, strong and uh, companies or institutions, then others want to join in. Uh, it's, it's our experience as well that we really haven't had to advertise or sell our science park for many, many years anymore because the values and the community kind of itself lures and pulls them in. And, and the but, same happens with the networks that we are just out there. Somehow the word gets out. There are so many questions coming in now and we will not be able to handle all of them. <laughs> we have about a minute left. So any closing remarks and please be, be very short and, and prompt. Uh, Jenny. I will just continue what Vaido just said, which is having a community is a very strong strategic sales resource. In the next couple of years, there's going to be a pressure on offices, people working from home, and having a strong community, being able to attract companies to still come to your park, or at least to your com community, is a real advantage. Thank you. Vaido. Uh, yeah, take a screenshot of all the questions and we will answer them later. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Mike, do you have any closing remarks? Well, you know, I think um, COVID-19 also teaches us that even communities are not, you know, just uh, 
a logic thing. So uh, I'm myself a very curious, how are we uh, seeing community and community building in the future, you know? If you work from home, everybody says it's easier, it's nice, but you know, we also said that we need um, physical proximity, that online, you know, it is more um, me, myself and I, instead of the community. So how do we do that? Uh, we, we have to invent new rules. So I think we, next year we will have Thank another, you. oh, six Thank seconds. You. We have five seconds. And I would like <laughs> to thank anyone who listened to us. We all agree uh, community is really, really important. So thank you everyone for sharing your insights. Bye bye. Yes, and obviously I would have given you uh, uh, with, uh, with love an entire audience applauding for all the wisdom that you shared with us and uh, also for keeping time. This is, if we, if we look at uh, a type of meeting like this, uh, you did very well in the, with the timekeeping. So uh, good job, Lena Miranda. And also uh, thanks to uh, the rest of the panel. And a great idea that I've heard, I think it was from Jernay or from Vido to, uh, to screenshot the questions and to talk about this later during the conference. Uh, but for now, I just want to, to thank you for your part and we're gonna go to the next part of the program. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.